All right, folks, we are here for a Window Wednesday Live, and this is going to be, sadly, the last Window Wednesday Live of the year. It's the day before Thanksgiving. It's 6 o'clock. I'm still at work, and I'm getting ready to go home, and I'm going to do some cooking. We're here on Instagram, and we're here on YouTube, and we're talking to both of you guys at the same time and super excited to be here and talk about, oh, well, this topic that I, I think is pretty going to be pretty popular for folks because I've had a lot of people asking me these questions. They're like, hey. I have problems with condensation. How do I deal with that? It's like, yes, I understand you have problems with condensation because it is fall, winter time, and that's usually when you have problems with condensation. So we are going to be talking about how to eliminate window condensation today. I have a post up on the blog. You can catch it. check that at thecraftsmanblog.com. Um, but uh, this post, this video that we're doing, this Instagram Live, this YouTube Live we're going to do, we are going to, I'm going to walk you through this stuff because I wrote a post on it, but it, it's just, it's not always the simplest to um, write it down, but my goodness, it's always easier to talk about how to deal with some of these things. And there's some nuance that you maybe miss. So really excited that you guys are here. We're going to do a Q and A at the end of this. Uh, for those of you that join live, if you do join these live, um, really excited for you to be here. And I want to hear from you. I want to get your comments uh, on here. And we're going to take a break. This is going to be the last one of these we're going to do for 2021. And um, I think we're going to come back. Uh, I haven't figured out the format in days yet, but we're going to come back with a new um, weekly live show that I'm doing about preservation and old houses. So this is more than likely our last window Wednesday, unless I get just an overwhelming support from y'all saying, no, we have to do windows, but we're going to do a Q&A session on uh, different stuff and just do some different topics because I've done around 55 of these, I think. So it's been a really good couple of years we've been doing these. So um, I'm just going to jump into the topic right away here and talk to you guys about window condensation. So window con condensation is a big problem, especially in the fall, those transitional seasons, fall and spring are going to be the biggest times when you have uh, condensation issues going on in your house. So the big issue with condensation, a lot of people think it's my windows. I need to replace my windows. It's not actually your windows. It's the humidity inside. So what happens when you get to these um, in, in between seasons, warmer air holds a lot more moisture and cooler air holds a lot less. So it's the same thing when you have a glass of ice water, the air right around the water is ice cold. It's 30 degrees, 40 degrees or whatever. And the air in the room is say room temperature, 75, 76 degrees, 76 degree weather temperature air can hold way more moisture than you can hold if you've got um, 40 degree weather. So what happens is as soon as that air cools down, it drops the moisture. Boom. That's why you get these cold fronts. Cold fronts come through. The moisture in the air falls down. Rain, sleet, snow, all that good stuff. We always love that this time of year. But as a cold front comes through, it's the combination of the hot and cold air that causes the moisture to drop out of that cold air because cold air just can't hold on to moisture like warm air does. So um, according to Mayo Clinic, it says the ideal humidity level inside a home is between 30 and 50%. 30 and 50%. Anything above or below that can cause issues either with your health or the health of your home. So really high humidity, you can have issues where you've got mold, mildew, um, bad respiratory issues for yourself. You're going to get lots of condensation for you in that case. If you're below 30 uh, percent, I don't know where the cutoff is really. I'm not an HVAC specialist, but I do know that there's a minimum amount of um, moisture of humidity that needs to be in the house just so your sinuses don't dry out. You don't catch colds as often if that's the case. That's why it's kind of an issue for you in dry climates like Arizona or, uh, you know, Las Vegas or things like that where it's really dry. You do have to hydrate, moisturize more often. But it, it does pose some functions, uh, some functional issues for your um, heating and cooling system if the humidity is too low. Like you can't have 10% humidity in your house and expect for it to be a healthy setup. So definitely something to think about on there. But what you really need to focus on is keeping that range, 30 to 50%. And in these months where you are using your, in the summer, we're using our AC all the time. That AC is blasting and keeping the moisture down. It keeps the humidity down every time it runs. But now you're in the fall and sometimes the winter where you're not running the AC much or you're not running the heater too much at all. It just kind of, it's comfortable. Well, that humidity builds up. So where do you get humidity in the house? Well, humans, I'm sitting here talking, a little bit of spittle. Apologize, try not to get it on you guys, but the I generate humans generate moisture. We are, you know, whatever, 90% water. So that water is evaporating. We are breathing. We have toilets in our house. We have sinks in our house. We take a bath. We take a shower. The steam comes up. It has to go somewhere. 
If you have a bath fan, great. If not, either way, there's more moisture getting into your house. You cook. Well, we just had some pasta last night. It's like I'm boiling water for it. That moisture is going into the house. Everything in your house, you've got plumbing, you've got water, you've got people talking, you've got heat and moisture emanating constantly. And you don't have any way for it to get out unless you've got some kind of ventilation or you've got HVAC that's taking care of it by the air conditioning running and pulling moisture out of the air or the heater running and doing some of that things. So what I'm going to walk through with you is some ways, the biggest ways you can lower the humidity in your house. So number one, huge thing and not something you're going to do like today, but is you need to get a properly sized HVAC. So if you've got um, an HVAC that's too small for your house, it's going to run constantly and cause, you're going to have low humidity, which is great, but you're going to burn it through that HVAC system. That air conditioner is just going to wear out very, very quickly. If you've got one that's too big for your house, now you've got the opposite problem. It's not going to run enough. It's going to cool it down real quick in the summer or even in these in-between phases, these in-between seasons. It's going to cool it down, run for maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then it's going to be down to the temperature it needs. And it won't have run long enough to cool off and remove humidity. It's cooled it, but it hasn't removed the humidity. That's important is that you need to size them properly. So if you get it properly sized, that's the first step in it. So next time you need an HVAC, make sure it's sized properly, two and a half ton, four ton, whatever size you need, make sure you've got the right size for it. You can't just have some random guy who's like, hey, I know ACs, I'll put one in. It has to be sized properly. And you can do some of those calculations. There are some resources online you can find to calculate it right. But most AC companies are very good and they'll help calculate it for you. The other thing you can do with your HVAC system is you can upgrade to a multi-stage or a dual-stage HVAC. We actually just did this in our house. I've noticed a noticeable difference in the uh, humidity levels in our house. We had a we have two new units, one downstairs and one upstairs. And the upstairs one was about 12 years old. It was time. It was going. And we upgraded to a dual-stage. Well, a dual-stage means it can run at full blast when it really needs it. Or in these in-between seasons, it's still running for us, but it's running at a much lower, like 50% or 40% capacity. So I'm not using all that energy but it's still running enough that it's pulling the moisture out of the air. And that's really key on this stuff is that you can pull that moisture out of the air with a dual or multi-stage HVAC. That's something that can normally see it's hundred percent or zero percent. And then a dual stage, you've got maybe 40 or 50% or hundred percent or zero. And a multi-stage can do everything in between. I don't know where the cutoffs are on them, but a lot of the, each different brand has their way, but you can do like 15, 20, 40, 60, 80. It can just, it varies itself depending on what the need is. So that's a huge advantage for cutting down humidity. If you have a multi-stage HVAC, you probably are not having nearly as much condensation issues as you would have elsewhere. So those are two things with your HVAC. Number three, install a dehumidifier. Um, I have younger kids and we had in their rooms and their kids humidifiers, which is ridiculous because I'm in Florida. God knows it's already humid out enough, but people do that for kids. What you really need is either you can do a whole house dehumidifier that can run separately, but runs through your ductwork. It runs separately from your HVAC. So you have a humidistat. So if you have something like a Nest thermostat, those will tell you what the humidity is. Some of those smart thermostats will show you the humidity and you can check those. So something to think about. And um, what the dehumidifier in a whole house is, it'll just keep, you set it to say 45% humidity and your HVAC will do some of that cooling, some of that dehumidification. But if it needs more, then the dehumidifier will kick on and just start dehumidifying the house through that. Or if you don't need a whole house, which can be kind of expensive to integrate, you could just have one that is in a room, in an individual room where you have, you know, say a laundry room where you have stuff hanging out and drying like we do is like it's a Chinese laundry in there. We have stuff that dries and the moisture goes into our house. You could put it in a bathroom if you have one where maybe there's not a vent fan or something like that. We'll talk about that. But simple little room dehumidifiers can make a huge difference. Another thing is to utilize a vent fan. So if you have, if you go take a shower in the morning and you don't turn on a vent fan, all that steam, you love that nice warm shower. It feels so good. I'm loving it. And all that steam is going into the house and it's going to dissipate and spread out and the bathroom will feel steamy for a little while, but then it, it has to go somewhere. So that steam, you need to have a vent fan, get a bath vent, vent fan, have a vent fan over your stove when you're cooking, turn it on, let it run for another like 10 minutes or so after you're done cooking or after you're done showering. Don't turn them off right away. You can set them to a timer if you want. That's a huge way to cut down on the amount of humidity in your house. It's really getting out in those areas. Another simple one, if you've got um, a lot of humidity building up in areas like closets or whatever, just grab some um, damp rid. It's a very inexpensive way 
They're little packets. I've even some people seen some people between their storm window and their prime window where they have some condensation. You can drop that little bag of damp rid in between the two and it's going to absorb that condensation in there, that moisture in there. You can put it in closets. They have them that go almost everywhere. It's a great, very uh, low tech version of cutting down on the humidity you need. And when it runs out, when it fills up and it's not working anymore, you just throw it away and you put a new one in there. Uh, another one, this may or may not work for you depending on if your windows are painted shut or whatever, but it's open your windows, right? So in the, in the cooler fall and winter days, if it's not super cold, we're not talking 10 degrees below zero, but if it's a pleasant day out there, say it's 55 degrees, you're like, it's kind of nice outside. It's a nice sunny day. Inside, my air conditioner or heater hasn't really been running that much, but it's in the 50s or 60s. Open your windows. It's going to be drier outside if it's clear, unless it's raining and stuff. But it light, usually in this season, when it gets cooler, it's going to be drier outside because that cool air can't hold as much humidity as the 75 or 70 degree weather inside. So open your windows. Let some of that moisture out. Let some of the cooler air come in. And it's going to help alleviate some of the condensation and the moisture in the house. So those are all ways that you can... Uh, get rid of the moisture, the lower the moisture, the humidity in your house. That's number one. Now, say you're doing everything you can to lower the humidity in your house. You've done all that. Now, what do you have left to do, right? Well, how do I get it? I wake up in the morning. It's been a cool night. And on my windows, they're all condensed with, I've just got, uh, I've got condensation all over the windows. Or if it's really cold outside, I've got frost on my windows, ice. That doesn't really happen to me in Florida, but it happened when I was living up in New York plenty you got to open your curtains. So what's happening is you're getting condensation between, say, you've got thick thermal curtains. We talked about some of this on the blog not too long ago, how to do some energy efficient upgrades to your uh, windows, is you can open those curtains if the sun is out. That's always wonderful. And it allows air to flow up against the windows. And that allows you to get that condensation to, to basically dissipate. It spreads it out. If the air, if you always have like plantation shutters or curtains and they're always closed in the fall and winter and spring, you're going to have a lot of condensation build up behind those. And you're going to have a lot of wood rot or peeling paint because of that. So when you can, as much as you can, open them up, let some air flow, turn on the fan too. You might say, I don't need the fan. It's cold. I'm, I'm not needing that right now. T reverse your ceiling fan and have it suck the air up. That creates airflow. You just need the air to flow and that will help that moisture, that condensation that's on your windows, that will help it evaporate quicker. If you leave the curtains closed, it will stay there and it will continue to get worse and worse and worse and it will damage your windows. So steel windows are rust, wood windows are rot, not a good thing for you. Another thing you can do is install storm windows or actually, believe it or not, screens actually will help with this. So down here in Florida, a lot of us don't have storm windows. The rest of you in the country, why not have an exterior storm window or you can do an interior storm window and that gets you some double pane efficiency. Even if you've already got double pane windows, put a storm on the outside or on the inside and it's more efficient. You're going to have less chance of condensation. On the inside, putting a storm on, that means where is the condensation going to happen? It's going to happen on the storm window, not on the prime window. And you can easily wipe that down. It protects your main window. On the outside, surprisingly, well, not surprisingly with a storm, but surprisingly, even with screens, if you've got a windy, cold, windy night, and that wind is blowing right on your window, you're going to get more condensation on there because the glass is going to get colder, even though, say, it's 35 outside. If the wind chill is 20, it's going to blow on that window, and it's going to cause more condensation, colder glass on the inside. And I've noticed that even the addition of a screen, which acts like a wind screen, it blocks some of the wind from hitting the window, will really cut down on the condensation. So if you don't have storms on your windows and you do have screens, and you take your screens down for the winter, consider putting those back up. That's a good option for you that you can actually cut down on the condensation because it keeps the window itself a little bit warmer, something you haven't thought of. So the storm windows, we just talked about that last week. Go check out that video. I've got a lot of in-depth stuff on storms, what to do, what types to use, and everything like that. I'm not going to get into it much, but obviously a storm window adds double pane efficiency and it's not like these old timers had no idea about a storm window. They knew that you could use storm windows for more efficiency. So you can too. Um, next thing is you can turn the thermostat down. I know that sounds scary to you folks, right? I keep it. At, I need to have it at 76 all winter. Oh dear God, that's expensive. But you, if you turn it down, like we were talking about, colder air holds less moisture. If you can turn it, if you can bear to turn it down, you can be like my wife and go get an electric blanket. Um, whatever you need to do to stay warm, you can wear a sweatshirt or whatever. If you can turn it down, then that air is going to hold less moisture and you're going to have less chance of condensation. I know that may not be for everybody, but
but let me give you a little um, sample of this here. So um, 40% humidity at 70 degrees. So I, we went and did these calculations. And if you're on YouTube in the description, I've got a uh, dew point calculator, which is what condensation is all about. When the air hits the dew point, the dew, aka condensation forms. So 40% humidity at 70 degrees means that there's approximately 35% more moisture in the air than 40% humidity at 60 degrees. So the way a dew point works or the humidity works is when you say there's 40% humidity, that means the air at its current temperature is holding 40% of the humidity of the moisture that it can hold at that temperature. But like I said, 70 to 60 degrees, 60 degrees can hold less water in the air and therefore 40% humidity is 35% less humidity or moisture than 70 degrees. Have I thoroughly confused you yet? Maybe. My apologies if I have. For those of you who just join us, please give me your comments here if you're joining us live. I'd love to hear your comments. I'll answer your comments and questions in the uh, chat here in the uh, video and we can get to those at the end of this. So I'm almost to the end of this and I'm going to jump into some of the Q&A here. Um, so the more, basically the more you can lower your temperature, the more you, the less moisture you have in the air and the less chance you're going to have of condensation. So that means you can use space heaters in certain rooms if you want to. You can use, um, you can uh, light a fire. So that's the next one I want to talk about is lighting a fire. Most people, it's like obviously if you're using forced air heat or steam heat radiators, obviously that's good because it keeps the, you know, keeps you comfortable. But uh, steam radiators, so or water boilers, things like that, they also generate a lot of moisture in the air. So that can be a problem for your condensation. So um, think about that. Lighting a fire is a strange one that you might be like, well, it's kind of old fashioned, but honestly, lighting a fire is one of the best ways to cut down a condensation. So you're, I'm telling you, turn the thermostat down and I'm telling you, light a fire. Yes, absolutely. Turn the thermostat down, light a fire, because fire pulls moisture out of the air. I don't know if you guys ever remember the, the Incredibles thing where Frozone's in the middle of the fire at the beginning of the first movie and he can't do anything because there's, he's so dry because of the fire. Well, fire actually does have that effect. It's not just a cartoon. If, you are, if you've got a fire lit and you get a decent fire going, it will pull not only warm the room, but it will pull moisture out of the room. So it's really going to do two things. It's going to dry and heat your room. So a fireplace is, it may be old fashioned, but honestly, if you can light one up, light a fire. That's going to be the best way to cut down to both warm up a room or a house and cut down on the condensation that's uh, the moisture in the air that's causing the condensation. So think about that. I've got a, a question already from somebody. Any advice for avoiding fog on windows? All this, all these things, right? Lots of advice for uh, avoiding fog. All these things. If you go back and watch the video uh, on here, you'll see that there's a ton of um, things that we're talking about on here on, and on YouTube. I've got some of the notes on here too. You can go visit a post on the craftsmanblog.com about this. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please, I'm happy to take them right now. We're going to start the Q&A in just a sec. I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor. That is Abitron, at Abitron Inc. on Instagram. Or you can follow them, uh, go to www.abitron.com. Fantastic company. They make the epoxies we have. So they've been supporting Wood Window Wednesday, uh, Window Wednesday for year for the last two years as we've done this now and they're a great sponsor they're the product i use the most i use their uh, liquid wood and their wood epochs all the time what they make are epoxies for repairing um, for repairing wood for repairing concrete for repairing metal if you've got something especially for historic properties that you don't need to throw out just because there's a rotten corner or something like that or it's a hard to find molding profile and you're like where am i going to get this done why not simply repair it with a really good structural wood epoxy much better than wood filler or anything like that. I did some testing on this for five years. You can find that on my blog. Uh, it's called the wood filler and it's epoxy test. I did five years of a piece of wood out in my backyard and their product held up really, really well. So um, really great stuff. You can um, check them out, give them some love, give them a follow on Instagram or go check out their website. Um, and I love having you guys uh, check out our sponsor. They've been a really big support for what we're doing here. Um, all right, a couple of the questions. Somebody's asking about um, exterior corbels, uh, cedar. A uh, little off topic, but I'm always happy to answer questions about old houses. And that's one of the reasons I think we're going to be changing this format a little bit in the new year. And I'll be posting more about that later. But um, yes, you can do, I, I like Western red cedar. I think it's an excellent wood for um, exterior corbels, things like that. My favorite wood for any exterior woodwork is a Koya. Um, it is a the, kind of the next generation of treated lumber. Uh, no chemicals, not like pressure treated with 
arsenic and copper and all kinds of the yuck stuff. But um, it is a product that the wood just does not take up moisture and therefore it can't rot and it's really resistant to termites, powder post beetles, all that kind of stuff. Manufacturer gives us a 50 year warranty against its rot, which is pretty incredible uh, stuff. So uh, I, I think it, it performs a lot better. And it also, the wonderful thing about it is that it does not move. It doesn't like bow, twist or warp as it takes in moisture. So you don't have a door that sticks in the summer and is loose in the winter. So definitely something worth checking out. Another question is, do you prime the entire sash before putting window glass back in? Cl kind of. So a little, good question, a little bit, um, there's some finesse to that. So on casements, I prime the whole thing. Every surface on the sash, it all gets primed. On double hung windows, we leave the sides of the sash bare where they're going to go into the jam. That gives the uh, sash an ability to dry out. It also helps it to keep sliding well. It's not, it's not visible. Nobody sees it, so it's not a problem. Um, but I also leave the bottom of the bottom sash bare, no primer or anything, and I leave the top of the top sash bare. We've had a lot of people ask when we do that. They're like, you didn't finish. You forgot to paint here. I was like, no, no, no. I know that seems weird, but it is, it's been – John Lee came up with this, did some testing on it. And while the moisture content of the window, of the wood, can increase greatly because it's not primed or painted, it can also go down quickly. And that's the big issue with it is rot sets in when moisture content goes up in the wood and stays up for an extended period of time. And that happens when you prime it because moisture is always going to get into that wood. And if I leave those sections bare, I've given moisture a way that it can get out. So uh, it says also, I'm working on a house built in 1880 in Tombstone, Arizona. No weights on the sash. Yeah, 1880 uh, may not have had any uh, rope and pulley. You may not have double hung. You may have single hung. Or they may have done double hung with different balance system. Maybe there's spring bolts. Maybe there's meant to be held up by a, uh, a stick. We sell something called a window stick that Allison Hardy uh, showed me in design. And it's basically just an attractive stick that you put under the sash. And it's not uncommon for single hung or older windows when you get to stuff back in the day. The double hung rope and pulley window uh, with counterweights was kind of the standard for decades. But uh, there are options before then with different kinds of uh, balances and different kinds of mechanicals. Lots of stuff out there. So i um, so glad to have you guys. Thank you so much for uh, coming here. Uh, let me see if I got any other questions from folks. Some folks talking about the um, about Abitron. Um, and I think we are done. There's a slow Q&A today because, hey, it's the day before Thanksgiving. So all of you guys have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. Oh, one more thing I got to tell you. And I know this video is going to be um, here and there, but I wanted to let you guys know, if you haven't checked out my stories on Instagram or anything, go check out my store. We're doing a sale started this afternoon and it goes until December 1st. All right. We're doing a Black Friday sale. I never do. I've never done it before in the history of the store and had it for six years. We're doing free shipping on everything. I wanted to, to give you guys a break. The shipping sucks right now. It's expensive, but we were like, you know what? Just for a few days only, we're going to do it this way. And when we sell out, we sell out of stuff, but anything you get, Putty, pro scrapers, any of our tools, any of our books, anything. It's all free shipping from now until December 1st. Two other things on there. One, our IR paint stripper that we've been selling. That back down from $129 to $99. Plus, you're getting free shipping. So you're getting almost like 50 bucks off of that thing right now. So um, get them while they last. We're getting another shipment soon. But that sale is going on only until uh, December 1st. On December 1st, it goes away. Also, if you guys are interested... If you're here talking about windows and you want to learn how to restore your windows, go check out my course, thewindowcourse.com. Um, right now, it, the lifetime package uh, sells for $5.97, but not right now. It's $4.97, and if you're one of the first 15 to buy, you get it. You use coupon code Black Friday, you get it for another hundred dollars off. So you'll get the whole package for $3.97, and that package comes with a free IR paint stripper. So you're really getting it for $2.97. I mean, we've cut the price way down. Again, those are just going on through December 1st. I can't do it for forever, but I wanted to make it available to you guys because y'all have been so great. I love having you guys such great viewers, readers. Thanks for being a part of this and for supporting it. I hope you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. See you next year. We'll be on social media. Come check us out, but we're not going to do these lives again until next year. So January, here we come. Thanks, y'all.